and welcome to the Beer Ladies podcast. I'm Lisa and I'm your host this week and I am joined by Erica and Christina. Hello ladies. Hi. Hello and this week we are talking about building a beer library and we're going to start off with kind of your basics, some things you want to have there in your arsenal but we're not going to go through absolutely every kind of beer book out there. In fact we are specifically not going to be talking about some of those beer business books because there are a lot of them and they're all kind of samey to a certain extent. Not going to get too much into books about specific local places, but we are going to talk about uh, books about brewing and home brewing, some beer history books, some style guides, and really importantly too, some online references if you feel like you can't go out and buy all of these at once. So we're, we're looking after your wallets here as well. <laughs> so as you guys know, we are on all the socials. We are at Beer Ladies Pod on Twitter, on Instagram. We are Beer Ladies Podcast uh, in other places. So we're on YouTube. If you're watching us on YouTube, hello. We're going to try to show you some books. Uh, if you're just listening, we're going to try to show you some books on Instagram or someplace else. So with that said, don't forget to, you can buy our merch. More about that later. But with that, I'll say, what are you drinking? And Erica, I will start with you. Yeah, so... Uh... I have got Dark Steering, which is a Schwartz beer from mm. Whiplash. Uh, and I just want to give a shout out to my colleague, Luke, uh, who had a hand in developing this recipe. Um, really, really love it. It's 5.2%, um, so just right for podcasting. <laughs> Perfect pod podcast beer. I love that. And I, I actually had that on, on tap for the first time recently. I, I had it in cans uh, when it came out last year, loved it, got more this year, but it was really nice to see it on tap recently. So yay, lovely beer. And Christina, what have you got? Well, I'm doing the uh, annual spring cleaning of the beer cabinet, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I got this for Christmas. Um, oh, wow. It's the Sierra Nevada Celebration Fresh Hop IPA. Um, and it's very good still. So, you know, it's great, but uh, yeah, trying to you know clear out the old beer, and make room for the new beer. Um, it's nice. Yeah, I, I had one of those uh, one of those episodes myself yesterday, and found out that a couple of things I had were uh, were not as good as that uh, anymore <laughs> in terms of their fitness for for drinking. So there were a couple of drain pours of beers I normally like. I'm not going to call any of them out because these things happen. Sometimes they're just in the fridge too long. Um, I guess for some of our listeners, that's not a problem. You guys go through, but I'm, I'm only little, I can't do that. Uh, and <laughs> I am drinking the Hope American Pale Ale Summer Seasonal for Ooh. this year. Uh, I don't know if anyone, um, anyone else around Dublin has seen, but they actually now have some deck chairs uh, with the branding for their seasonal beer. And I thought that was adorable. So well done, Hope, for bringing out some interesting merch uh, that I haven't seen before. So yeah, very cool. So with all of that preamble, Beer books. There are so many different avenues you can go with this. I, I have, I've been collecting beer books since probably 1996-ish. Uh, I can talk a little bit about some of these that I have that I wouldn't recommend, but there are so many really, really interesting ones. And I thought, uh, actually, Erica, why don't we start with you? Because I know you've got yeah. so many interesting kind of academic <laughs> and technical ones. Yeah. And then we can kind of work around into some of the uh, sure. some of the more general ones after that. But we'll start with the good stuff. Yeah, so um, I work in a brewery and up in our lab and office area, um, we have several shelves um, where we can borrow books. And I brought one of the series home with me, just what I could fit in my backpack. <laughs> um, and uh, it's four different books and it's the different main ingredients of beer so the water one um oh, i know that book. is written by john palmer and colin kaminsky and i actually just listened to a talk by john palmer on the women's international beer summit and they said he literally wrote the book on water and um this is something that several of my colleagues uh, at work have the full set of and highly recommend it. So I think it's a really good uh, starting off point. Um, the malt one is written by John Mallet. The hops one is written by Stan Hieronymus. And then the yeast one is written by Chris White 
and Jamil Zanisha. Very nice. Um, and the other ones that I didn't have room in my backpack for, I'm just going to list uh, the highlights in terms of their titles and authors. Uh, so the Brewer Association's Guide to Starting Your Own Brewery by Dick Cantrell, uh, which I think would be really instrumental if you're wondering like where to invest your time and money in terms of equipment. Um, then there was a sort of trio uh, that came suggested to me if you can afford it. I think some <laughs> of these are several hundred euros each. Um, Technology, Brewing and Malting by Wolfgang Kunz. The Yeast in the Brewery, Management, Pure Yeast Cultures and Propagation by Gerald Onemuller, Hans J. Monger, and Peter Leitz. And Applied Mathematics for Malting and Brewing Technologists, Technological Calculations, Benchmarks and Correlations for Process Optimization, again by Onemuller and Monger. And those are the ones that if we have a question about a formula or something related to math, um, really great to have that paper in front of you. Um, would highly suggest um, like any any brewery have that book on those books on hand. Um, Brewing Science and Practice by Dennis E. Bridges, Chris A. Bolton, Peter A. Brooks and Roger Stevens, as well as Brewing by Michael J. Lewis and Tom W. Young. And The Principles of Brewing Science, A Study of Serious Brewing Issues by George Fix. Uh, so serious if, brewing issues. If I something goes wrong, you know, you can't quite figure it out. There's a mistake. Um, yeah, like I, I, I would love to go through that and see like what they found. <laughs> Yeah, and, and for those of you who are just listening and not watching, I think when you mentioned the, the math one, Christine and I are both like, oh, that sounds hard and upsetting, but I absolutely see the value of having that book so that you can absolutely and yeah. not have to try to figure this out in your head or be looking it up when you're in the middle of a boil or something. And, and you know, <laughs> we've, we've got Microsoft Excel, um, so like various spreadsheets on our computer in the brewery. Um, and then I have a few statistical software packages on, on my laptop. So it's just a matter of plugging in uh, <laughs> the right calculations in the right order. Um, Not, no, in fairness, like when I do my medieval recipes, I, I often bemoan how much mass I actually end up having. To oh, do. yeah. <laughs> so like I, I totally get the, 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 the point and it's really important, but my, my brain just goes, oh, no. <laughs> well, and I, I think um, as long as you have like a basic understanding of chemistry in terms of things like the relationship between temperature and pressure or mm -hmm. what is pH um, or specific gravity, like you're almost there. Like a lot of this advanced stuff is, is maybe assigned to the lab manager or right. you know, you'd be able to troubleshoot it with someone from another brewery or perhaps a university. Um, there's kind of a fun one uh, that's Beer Health and Nutrition by C.W. Bramford. And that's actually um, from what I've been told by my colleague more about like the the potential health claims about beer itself. I thought oh, it was about the health of the beer. Yeah, yeah. I would have thought it'd be about the yeast or something. Oh, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. interesting. Oh. I want to read that now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And we we really love uh, Belgian beers, and we had um, the grisette that I drank recently on mm. the podcast come out. Uh, so there was this trio of of books um, that I wanted to give uh, recognition to. Brew Like a Monk, Trappist, mm -hmm. Abbey, and Strong Belgian Ales and How to Brew Them, uh, again by Hieronymus. Wild Brews, Beer Beyond the Influence of Brewer's Yeast by Jeff Sparrow, and Farmhouse Ales, Culture and Craftsmanship in the Belgian Tradition by Phil Markowski. Uh, Belgium was one of my favorite uh, beer trips. I would, I would love to go back and, and visit some of the abbeys and see how the Trappist beer is made and um, you know, not all of this 
we can do here in Ireland and some right. some of this might have like a geographical indicator that that protects that name. Um, and especially with the, the wild and mixed fermentation, you know, you have to be very careful about cross contamination and, and your physical space. So for me, a lot of that is just more curiosity and, and learning rather than, you know, applying knowledge um, at, at work. And then uh, my colleague Lewis had a few of these books at home that he said were worth mentioning. Uh, Brewing Yeast and Fermentation by Chris Bolton and David Quain. Um, I've kind of gotten into yeast the last few weeks more mm -hmm. heavily and uh, I think it's definitely an unsung ingredient but so very very important um, yeah in terms of cropping and pitching and it's amazing. <laughs> um, and then the other ones um, are written both by John Woods and Keith Rid Ridgely, and it's the beers of Wallonia and the beers of France. And I know we're not talking too much about specific guides in terms of countries, but um, my stepdad is 100% Flemish, and he has a big interest in Belgium as well. And uh, my my dad side of the family were French. So that's just kind of of personal interest to me. So yeah, oh, absolutely. And and always shout out to friend of the podcast, Charlotte, who's Belgian. Hi, Charlotte. That's right. Yeah. Listening. <laughs> always good to be able to put some of these in front of her and say, what do you think? So, and, and actually, maybe that's an interesting segue too over to Christina thinking about, you know, like you said, some of your historic recipes, are there books that you would recommend or again, sources too, because I love you know, before we started recording, you were like, there are also things that are online. And that is, I think, so important that people can access things and don't necessarily have to go out and buy everything because some of these are not cheap. So. Okay. Well, yes. So, so yeah, I can give everyone what I'm going to call attentively a broke girl's guide to <laughs> free beer history sources on the interwebs. Um, and honestly, even if you're not broke, like these are great sources and you should use them. So um, the first thing I'm going to recommend, um, first I'm going to talk about secondary sources. So this is sources that are written by modern scholars. Um, I'm really only going to talk about more academic sources and not uh, journalists yeah. as such. Um, so I'm just going to properly talk about uh, articles written by historians or scientists or someone either in academia or who has studied to be or has spent enough time doing something that has you know what I mean everyone knows what I mean we get it anyway we get it. hashtag we get blessed it. yeah yeah secondary sources so my recommendation for finding secondary sources for the first place would be to look at JSTOR now it used to be that JSTOR you had to go through a university and oh my gosh, not everyone has access to that. And that's really got sort of this gatekeeping thing. But anyway, mm -hmm. you don't have to do that anymore. So you as an individual, just you can sign up and you can get access to 100 free articles to read online a month. And it's so handy. So there's lots of stuff on there about beer history. Now, when you're looking through this for beer history, it's not always going to be, you know, Ale wives of X, or right. a lot of times what you're going to be looking for is economic history, um, women's history in particular, if you're going back to medieval, early modern, but a lot of it's going to be wrapped up in economic history or food and drink studies, those kind of ideas in general. Um, also legal cases, a lot mm. of times you find this kind of thing in legal cases, so look into those and also literary sources, but I'm just going to talk about the secondary sources at the moment. But those are the kind of studies that you're going to be looking for. And they're a great way to raid their bibliographies for primary sources. Absolutely. Are the sources that are written by the people that the situation happened to or close to or, you know, thereabouts. So a medieval source, primary source to be written in the medieval period. Okay. So I recommend JSTOR 
very highly for academic secondary sources. You can also follow that, find some on Google Scholar, but they're not always online, but it mm -hmm. will tell you sources to look for. If you have access to your local library, those sorts of things, it's a great way to sort of raid sources. Um, now I'm going to talk more about finding primary sources, which is mm -hmm. a little bit, it. which is my favorite. So yes. there's lots of really good primary sources online. Um, Ireland in particular should be really proud of themselves of like the work that they put into digitizing all of these primary sources. Um, so there's Kelt, for example, and I'm going to put all of these in the show notes. So you do not have to listen to me and write down any of these <laughs> things. Don't worry. They have tons of literary sources written in Irish with translations, written in Latin with translations about medieval Irish history, early modern Irish history, modern Irish history. It is an unfathomably important resource and you have free access to it, friends. It is free. It is out there and it is free. Use it. I love it. There's a lot of really good beer history stuff in there. But again, it's not going to be Alewives of X. It's going to be you reading and looking and saying, oh, that mentions ale. Okay, what's the, you know, what's sort of the context around that? So like, I guess my point that I'm trying to hammer home is that you do have to kind of dig for this and you will find it. And it's, again, Celt is a really, really great source for that. Um, there's Circle, there's, which there's the Chancery records. You can search all through all of the Chancery records. So the letters that were sent by um, the King of England or the Kings of England, I should say, into um, the colonial governments in Ireland. They're all there. The 1641 depositions are all online. All of this great free stuff is on line. And I, again, I will link to all of that. Um, so for Irish history, there's a lot of amazing primary sources that you just have free access to, which I love. I really think it's important that primary sources that are digitized should be free with access to all and not um, gatekept by institutions, um, particularly if it's like a project through a university that should be free access for everybody. Um, not the same necessarily for secondary sources, but especially for primary sources, that should be free access for everyone. That said, there's also specific beer history stuff that you can find online. Now I'm only gonna talk about an Irish and, or Irish and UK context. So Scotland, Wales, um, England and Ireland um, as such, because that is my research area. So I'm sure that there's other um, primary sources that you can find online about other things. But that, those, those are what I'm going to talk about. So for Scotland, the Stent Rolls of Aberdeen are online. So you should look at those because they're incredibly fascinating. Um, I, was, I spent the last couple of weeks looking through those and they're really cool. Um, for Ireland, as I said, I've already given you some of those. Um, for Scotland, Wales, and England, as well as Ireland, actually, um, Alfred Bernard went on these amazing tours in the late 19th century of all of these breweries, oh, and, yes. and all of his books are online. So they're free, they're out there, and I will, again, put a link for you, but it's like reading a modern beer bloggers trip to a brewery. Like he talks about the size of the mash tons and every little detail you'd ever want to know. You could build a brewery based off of what he is saying. He's very into vessel size, this guy. Like you're like, is this a euphemism, my dude? Like what's going on here? But no, fascinating. Such a nerd and I love it. I love he, it. He's such a nerd. Like it's it's all of these little tiny details where the hop back is, where everything goes, how it all works. It's great. It is so valuable if you want the ins and outs of brewing in the UK and Ireland in the late 19th century. Like that's your source. Like it it's just and he went everywhere and it's it's basically everywhere. like industrial espionage. It's amazing stuff, but he just published it like you said like a blog. It is it's all out there. And like yeah. he specifically, I think he went to smaller breweries and big breweries. So you have the contrast of the massive scale of Guinness, which was like 42 acres or something when yeah. he went to see it compared to smaller breweries that were only three acres, only three acres, it's oh still a big brewery, right? <laughs> but 
this is the kind of scale that we're talking about. So I, I highly recommend that that is online. Um, there are several, I think there's, there's a years at least of the Brewer's Gazette online. So then again, that's 19th century and really fascinating stuff ads for all kinds of things that you can, that you need for your brewery. Plus like, you know, economic reports and talking about, you know, beer being exported into different places, but also really sad things about people dying in breweries and how they died and why they died and how, which is really important because it gives us insight into the dangers of brewing in that period. Cause I think Absolutely. sometimes we just like gloss over it, like beer working in a brewery. It's so cool, but it can actually be incredibly dangerous. Yeah. And I think making sure that we're bringing that nuance to the conversation and we're talking about, you know, how difficult and hard life could be for working class people is a really important part of our conversations. And I think leaving, including those elements, which we don't see so much because often the voices that we hear are from brewery owners mm -hmm. or head brewers or, you know, so anyway, I think it adds a really important voice to the conversation, one of many angles to, oh, to, yeah. to talk about. Um, with that said, you can also look at newspapers, but a lot of those have been digitized, but a lot of them are pay to play. So you have to pay a certain fee a month to use them. Now, they're a really important source, and I do recommend them, but they can get expensive. They can. Yeah. Um, so that's that's where you're at with that. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend all these and Google books again, Google books has a lot of these sort of primary sources available. They have the, like the notes from the house of commons in Ireland. They have all of these minutes, these sorts of things to look through for beer laws, mm -hmm. brewers that are doing things that they shouldn't be doing <laughs> these kinds of things. They're all out there. So I would recommend looking through that kind of thing specifically for recipes, beer recipes. Um, you can, you can find them in through a variety of ways, but um, I'm not going to give away all my state secrets. But <laughs> <laughs> Wait for the book. Buy the book when it comes out, people. Yeah. Yes. Well, there's two of them now. So I have, Books. Books. yes, there's, there's two. So I'm writing one on uh, about the UK now as well. Uh, just signed a contract for that. So there will be two books coming out. Um, but yeah, so there's a different, there's a lot of different places. And sometimes breweries, if they're still around, you know, they hide their old recipes, but you know, there's, there's notebooks and there's things that you can find with that. But the last thing I'll say about free or cheap stuff online is this can all get incredibly overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend getting something like Zotero, um, which is free. And it's, it's just like a plugin. You just click and it adds it to a, basically you're making a digital library mm -hmm. and you can have all different folders and folders within folders and it helps you keep everything really nice and organized. I use Zotero. I swear by Zotero. I think it's an amazing thing that I did not find until after I did my PhD. <laughs> this makes you want to smack my head against the wall because it's so handy. So handy. I don't lose anything. I keep everything in track. So I really do recommend Zotero for organizing it. Oh, and I will say, Last but not least, there's a lot of really good history blogs out there. Um, so for that one, I'd say I'll just mention one. So shout out to Liam of Beer Food Travel, whose Irish history blog is a must read um, if you're interested in sort of- Hard agree. Yeah. Yay, Liam. Yes. <laughs> uh, I was just going to add something to what Christina said about um, the accessibility in terms of free or cheap. Um, you know, books can be- really big they can be really heavy and for someone like me who moves all the time and yeah. uh I do like having a book in my hand as opposed to an e-reader but yeah like we don't all have space to just keep Absolutely. collecting physical books and especially during COVID um you know a lot of us weren't allowed to go to a library so I think there's so much value in online resources and not to mention like the the sustainability aspect of it you know like you're you're not waste well wasting paper mm -hmm. and ink and shipping and that sort of thing so logistically and practically like I I think it does make a lot of sense to include that as part of your your beer library and not just you know the ones that you can 
hold and look at on your your bookcase um yeah well and also just as a lazy person if you're doing <laughs> beer history research and you're especially like you're looking at a book that you don't know if they're going to include yeah. beer or not if you find mm-hmm. it online you can search through the book mm-hmm. so you don't Absolutely. have to read the whole book until before finding out if it's going to include the mm-hmm. thing that you wanted to want it to include sure. and even if you can't find the whole book online you can go to google books and a lot of time even if the whole book's not available without writing an ebook you can still search through the book to see if it even talks about the mm-hmm. topic you're interested in and you can search and say oh don't even talk about it so it's not worth my time to you know to go through this unless you know it's adjacent to whatever else but you can also say okay so it does talk about this oh it talks about it a lot okay so now this <laughs> maybe might yeah. be something i want to invest in sure. um and with that i will also add there are, of course, online unlimited libraries that you can have access to there. I have one and it's like, I think $7.99 a month, um, which I also highly recommend because you can search the books again, which is so handy. And if you don't like the book, put the book down. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't pay for the specific mm-hmm, book. Mm-hmm. So I don't feel like right. I'm out money if the book it just isn't what I need the book to be and there, this is all very legal like this is not oh, yeah. I'm not I'm not talking about pirating books yeah, um, yeah which which is which is you know you have your own ethics on that uh, it's not for uh-huh. me to tell you what to do with that sure. but um yeah so I like it because sometimes books aren't so great sometimes they're really good you know so yeah it all depends and and again and and putting on my ex-librarian archivist hat, shout out to the librarians, archivists, paraprofessionals who have been doing that digitization work because there's a lot of work there and Mm -hmm. some people like to minimize that labor. Hashtag not all researchers because we all get it, but just thank you for doing that work. It's amazing work. And for people who need to fund that kind of work, it's really important. This is why. So yeah, soapbox down. So I I so agree. I think digitization is one of the most important things. I think especially just, just, just to add, sorry, that, that letting people who are not in specific and like, I don't think it's fair that only people who are in academia or in academic circles have access to primary sources. Absolutely. I think that information should be freely accessible to everybody, especially these huge databases and things like that. Everyone should be able to access those things. And the work, the work that people do, as you're saying, Lisa, it's just so, 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 so important. So important. Oh, absolutely. And and so now I'm going to do another another little pivot. So I'm going to talk about some of my physical books that I think are, I, I went through and I, again, I, I have a lot of beer books because I'm an old and I've been collecting them for a long time, but I've pulled out the ones that I think people would find particularly interesting or that are kind of one of those things you might want to have as a cornerstone in your physical library, knowing you don't want everything to be physical. Because again, really important point. Sometimes you want to be able to just search and find the thing you're looking for. But other times it's kind of cool to pick up a book from the nineties or early two thousands and be like, (laughs) Oh, that's, that's where that was then. Okay. So great, uh, sort of, um, case in point, I've I've got quite a few books by, by Michael Jackson, um, holding up one now. And and for people who are nowhere to beer, not that, not that one, the the other one, the beer one, uh, go look him up. He was a lovely avuncular Yorkshireman, just just a delight. Met him a fair few times. Always had wonderful conversations with him. He's been he had been you know nice enough to autograph uh, several of my books uh, before he passed away, unfortunately. But I was just looking at my seventh edition of his Pocket Guide to Beer, and th- this is one of these books that was very just like functional. I'm sure it is digitized out there now, and you could just search it, which I think would be really valuable. But I'm looking at Ireland and. Uh, you know, they talk about Guinness, of, of course, but what's so interesting is the only place for beer that's not Guinness or Beamish or Caffrey's uh, is one, uh, just one porterhouse location. That's it. And he says, has its own flavorsome brews, as well as stocking some classics from Belgium and other nations. And that is it, uh, my friends. <laughs> there is literally nothing else. And this is the the edition from... 2000. So for uh, for everyone who was, you know, uh, doing stuff here in Ireland back in the day, there oh, yeah. there wasn't much. So I, I think the, the late 90s there would have been that first generation with O'Hara's and Franwell and Porterhouse. Yeah. And those are the main ones that are still around. Um, 
Absolutely. And, and another book of his that I do really recommend, again, even though it's kind of outdated now, is his Great Beer Guide. It's 500 Classic Brews. And the other reason I, I love this book is that it has beautiful, beautiful photography in it. And he just does essentially a little capsule review of each book. And of course, I'm, I'm cheating and opening it to Sarah Hughes's Dark, uh, Dark Ruby Mild, which is one of my favorite beers <laughs> ever. But you know, he, he has this wonderful, you know, sort of rundown of each of these beers, why they're interesting. And, and again, you know, from, from where we are now, this particular edition would be, uh, you know, wildly uh, out of date now. Yeah, text copyright 1998. So it's, it's been a while, but these kind of books were so influential and really helped people start a lot of those breweries that are, that are up and running now. So I, I've, I've got kind of a, a split of what I might call reference books and kind of more narrative oh. books, but um, I'm not going to pick up the big reference books because they're too heavy. <laughs> uh, another one is by Michael Jackson, though. He had the ultimate beer guide, and that, that was a wonderful book. Um, again, really giving you some insights into how these different styles are made, some examples. Again, beautiful photography. I have the Oxford Companion to Beer over here, which was edited by Garrett Oliver, and for, for those who were not on beer Twitter when this book came out, there was some controversy when it was first published because as with any big reference book, and it is like a book that is, you know, several centimeters thick, there are going to be things that are not quite right or things that were based on old research here and there. Again, because it's it's history, it's technical, it's it's a little bit of everything, but there was um, there was a beer Twitter brouhaha when it was published because there were a couple of history things that were just wrong. So again, I would say, it's absolutely a valuable book to have, but you know, as with any reference book of that type, know going in that more work has been done since it came out. It's never going to be completely accurate. So uh, totally worth having, but- and uh, I, I'm a huge, huge fan of Garrett Oliver. Absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, and again, especially when you're the editor, you know, your name's on the sort of the flag, you be like, lots of other people are doing work on this. So it's not up to you uh, exactly. <laughs> Um, but again, I'm, I'm going to stick with some of my pretty books first, which does not mean they don't have good text because they do. But Melissa Cole's Let Me Tell You About Beer is such a wonderful book. Um, again, it's just beautifully laid out. You know, obviously a little a little bit of a British focus because Melissa's amazing. But this book I, I love and I, I especially love that it's not a kind of gendered, you know, let me tell you about women's beer, which I think was what the publishers had initially wanted her to do. And she was like, Mm, no uh and so it's great it's really such a good introduction you, again none of that gatekeeping but also gets into the weeds a little bit um and one of her follow-ups the, the little book of craft beer oh you've got it they do. Yeah. it's just <laughs> so beautiful <The> <laughs> i know we're all like melissa if you're listening we need to we need to do a thing where we all need to get over to the uk and you know, say <laughs> hi or if you want to come to dublin we can yeah we can do a thing but I, I love that it's just such a beautiful book. I love the art mm. direction. Uh, I do notice that she, you know, the white hag is name checked in here. So definitely some, some Irish interest as well. But um, again, some wonderful things there, but I'm gonna dive into some of the narrative things that I think people should just have because they're really interesting. So my, my first one is Pete Brown's Man Walks Into a Pub. And this mm. is the, the OG version. It doesn't look like this now. The, but that's Pete in the background on the uh, on the cover. So he's like ordering crisps or something, but he's not even in the foreground. But uh, <laughs> um, but during during COVID lockdown, he did a, a book club basically with all of his books. Highly recommended. It was so much fun, such a good time. And, and, and he has since, you know, said, look, obviously I got some stuff wrong in this. It was written a long time ago now, but he'll call those things out. New editions have been revised and it's just such a fun book. Like when it says... A sociable history of beer it really really is it's it's really just so engaging so much fun to read um and i didn't pull out his other books just because i have all of them and that would have been too many but he's doing such interesting work now in other kind of beer adjacent areas whether that's uh cider or he's got a book out now about working men's clubs so love that it's going all social history and um really really interesting stuff um but i'm also going to call out one or two sort of uh, North American specific ones because I think they are really important in kind of the development of craft beer and just beer history. So I'll first do The Audacity of Hops. So, and this is by uh, Tom Asatelli. So Tom, sorry if I get your name pronunciation wrong, but really interesting in terms of kind of, 
you know, moving away from that sort of macro brewing into what we call micro or craft. That said, I think, you know, it is probably also showing you some of the problematic tropes that this set up in terms of sort of, oh, all macro bad, all craft good. And, you know, again, that's a little, um, uh, not, not saying that it's like that in this book, but I think that is a narrative that has come out of that, uh, that sort of history, if you like. But I think if you read the book, again, it's, there's a little more nuance there gets it into a little bit more that you know, there, there are some things to consider there and just a really good sort of uh, backgrounding and how we got where we are. And even though it is an American book, I think you absolutely see the same thing either here in Ireland or in the UK or even in some place like Germany or elsewhere. But uh, my, my one of my favorites is uh, also this one. So Maureen Ogle's Ambitious Brew is such a great book. Uh, hi, Maureen. Um, always a big fan. If you're not following her on Twitter, you, you should get on that because this is, I, I really think, one of the best history books out there about anything, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's beer, whether it's with something else, she just does an amazing job, makes it so accessible, has good footnotes. So it's really good for both, you know, you know, someone who wants to go and look up some of those primary sources, as well as people who are just kind of new to the topic. Again, it really sets the scene well. Um, and the last one I'm going to call out specifically um, again, is, is uh, Boke and Bailey's 20th Century Pub. So for those of you not all, all, already following Jessica and Ray online, they do their amazing roundup each week of what people are writing about beer, their, their own stuff too. It is just so interesting. And, and this is fascinating to me because they're looking at the evolution of British pubs over the 20th century. And uh, there are things you don't even think about now, like kind of roadhouses and all of these other things that have sort of fallen by the wayside. And it's it's so interesting to see kind of, again, the social history of, of kind of drinking and, and drinking in pubs throughout that era and how, you know, it goes from this very sort of blokey thing or very sort of gender segregated thing to being much more accessible. And again, sometimes in ways that are, are not always great. It's, uh, it's great that they, they look at all those things from multiple angles. But uh, those are some of my ones where I would say, if you want to buy some physical books, these are going to be a good place to start. I, I was also sort of going back and forth, like, oh, I have some really great books by Martin Cornell and Ron Pattinson. But I feel like you guys should start with these first mm -hmm. and then move into those once you kind of already know what they're talking about. And, uh, and then you'll be all set up for it. But I did also sort of pull out the Beer Enthusiast's Guide by Greg 2G's Smith. And the only reason I, I sort of mentioned this one is because it is copyright 19. And it is fascinating to see, you know, kind of what, what people talked about, you know, in terms of, of beer, because uh, for example, um, if you, you, you have sort of, you know, lots of different kinds of loggers mentioned um, under ales, like you, you don't even get uh, sort of IPAs mentioned as a key beer style. You have to go into other beer styles to get, uh, uh, to get anything like that, or even cider, uh, something he calls mead beer. So that's, uh, that's a whole that's a whole thing. And again, this doesn't mean anyone was like dumb or things were wrong. It was just different. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm even now just sort of flipping through like, I'm on like almost page 60, still haven't, uh, uh, there, page 58 is when I first see an IPA listed anywhere. And it's just kind of in a, in a chart, but it's, it's also got some amazing artwork in it. I'll, I'll try to put some pictures of this on, on the socials where I love that your, your beer judge, first of all, who is a dude wearing a tie, um, <laughs> uh, which again, and also I'd like to point out dude wearing a tie, no beard, no beard. Mm. So, yeah. you know, um, but, but I love that he says a good and practical beer judge will carefully evaluate beer characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. We'll also make suggestions to the brewer on ways to better the style sample, which you know, fair, you know, all, all good, but it's, uh, it, it is a fascinating book and he sort of explains yeast and, and hops and it, it's, it's the kind of book that, um, it, it would be so basic again, in air quotes now, but there's a whole section on preparing for the BJCP exam from back in the nineties. And it is, you know, again, it's just so interesting to look and see kind of how, how far we've come, if you like. Um, and, and he even has a, a, there's a, there's an appendix of homebrew supply shops, but 
the the last appendix is just where you can find breweries and and it is um, and, and again i'm saying th th this is it it's like six <laughs> pages there aren't other breweries that's that's it so it is really tiny uh, most of them are in california and there just aren't any kind of rest of world so i love having this kind of book just to look back and be like wow you know it was a whole whole different world and uh so, so there's good times there but you know again to sort of circle back like everyone should have some michael jackson books you know mm -hmm. everyone should have some of these other books um and again i think it's wh whether sort of history is your thing or more kind of the, the technical end is your thing i was looking at all of my my homebrewing books and i was like i have them but i know i don't use them as well as someone like erica or christina so or tandy who's not well, on today and but. <laughs> and it's funny because um like it's an unpopular opinion, but I've never had a, a d personal desire to homebrew, and I've, I've, I've done it. <laughs> like they so pay me for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I like when I first started my my beer library at home, it was yeah. largely homebrewing books. And right. this last time that we moved, I think I finally donated them all because I'm like, I'm not getting yeah. use out of these. Someone else will, and. There's a place on Parnell Street here in Dublin called Chapters, and they have a secondhand um, section. And I was recently in there and found at least three really excellent um, used books on beer and brewing, as well as three that were new. And, you know, they're kind of on my wish list um, to either receive as a gift for myself or to give as a gift to other people. And we, we got a lot of um, beer books for our wedding because of the theme. Um, one of them that I was going to share is from 2014, which is only eight years ago, but a lot of the breweries mentioned here in Ireland have kind of come and gone, and mm. so many that exist now aren't mentioned. So this is from Carolyn Hennessy and Kristen Jensen. It's called Sancha, the Complete Guide to Irish Craft Beer and Cider. And our Ladies Craft Beer Society of Ireland is actually mentioned in here, which I thought was really oh. special. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I would love for them to come out with a new edition that has all the updates and um, the other, well, I was going to say when Christina and I spoke with Mirella Amato, um, mm -hmm. she was also saying, you know, there's so many books out there about home brewing, and she has written her own book, which I have on my wish list. Um, but I, I think beer and food pairing, which is one of the things that she yeah. specializes in, is quite fascinating for those of us cooking and baking, especially over, you know, lockdowns. Um, and I'm a fan of Mark Dredge, and he has this mm. beer and food, food matching, um, bringing together the finest food and the best craft beers in the world. Oh, very nice. And always a good follow on Twitter as well. He is. And um, one that my mom got us for our wedding is the beer bucket list, over 150 essential beer experiences from around the world. And this is oh. something, before we go on a, a trip, um, we consult this and make notes about breweries to tour or craft beer bars to visit. And she also gave us the National Geographic Atlas of Beer, a globe-trotting journey through the world of beer. And that's by Nancy Holst Pullen and Mark W. Patterson. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, just so beautiful and well written, and ones that we're definitely going to save and cherish. And um, I, I like doing that kind of research when we travel as opposed to just Googling everything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, and actually, speaking of chapters, I, I think those used books might have been ones we just took down there because we just got new bookshelves and we did a bit of a, a tidy up and we have many other books to go but of course we're just trading it in for credit because you know yeah reasons yeah. so exactly yeah oh I know it's 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 a blessing and a curse I'm so glad they're back open but now I'm also like oh I can buy books locally mm -hmm. again oh yeah it's a um, whole thing and something else I was thinking about with the online databases and the scholarly journal subscriptions um you know, if you work in a brewery, um, that is something that your business can get a, an online access to, let's say, like a username and password that yeah. you can share as a team or a department. You know, it doesn't have to be paying as an individual, you know, Absolutely. That, 
um, that can be a, a company cost. That's a great point. Yeah, 100%. If you can get someone else to pay for it. And, and I've worked for some of these big like, like Elsevier and other kind of terrible behemoths. Like if you can get someone else to pay for it, do, do because that's where they make their money. It should not be on the individual person um, mm -hmm. for, for many reasons, many, many, many reasons. But you know, it is what it is. And um, sorry, I was looking for it, but I can't, I, I have it somewhere around here. Um, but the one beer history book that I will absolutely suggest, but I will say in advance that this is absolutely, um, you can, it is not written for a general audience. Mm. Um, it is accessible to a general audience, but it is definitely an academic book. And that is Judith Bennett's book about alewives in England from mm. 1300 to 1600. If you are interested in a sort of snapshot of brewing in that period, I cannot recommend her book enough, but it is definitely an academic book. Um, so do bear that in mind when you are working or reading it. Um, that's not to say that it, it is incredibly well written. It is fascinating. It is one of my favorite books of all time. Um, but yes, it is so well researched, very like all your footnotes. And I don't necessarily think that you have to have footnotes, um, but I do think you have to have a bibliography. So you have to yep. cite your sources. Yep. So I think I, if you're reading a beer history book, I think it's totally fine. If they mention the source and then it's all in the bibliography, that's yep. fine for me. But I do think you need to cite your sources some way. Agreed. in your yeah. books so that way people can f can find them um and read them for themselves but yeah sorry just just before I forgot because I did want to mention oh. her book it's just it's just so good it's just so so good <laughs> absolutely we, we love a little we love a little bit she, she's making the wrong people angry or the right people angry sorry not the wrong people the right people angry <laughs> work we always love that so always good to read it and, and completely great. <laughs> Another reason to cite your sources is just um, plain old ethics and, and morals, and you want to avoid plagiarism. So please, please always give credit where credit is due. Here, here. Well, here. well yes. And, and I mean, and it's also that way, you know, your research should be based on primary sources. If you're writing about beer history, it should be based on primary sources, um, unless you're just writing a blog post, and then that's a whole nother kettle of fish. But um, you should be able to back it up with primary sources, because the primary sources don't say it happened. It probably didn't happen. Um, and even if they say it happened, it might not have happened. And that's a whole nother kettle of fish. But anyway, <laughs> you need to be able to support your argument. Absolutely. So, so yes, very important part. But yeah, so recommend Judith Bennett's book because it's just so good. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to hear it. So I think we'll start to wrap up, but anything else you guys would recommend? I don't know, Erica, any last uh, <laughs> recommendations? Well, um, so I, I have something funny and silly to share. Yeah, My last it. title is called Goodnight Brew, and it's oh. a bit of a parody on Goodnight Moon, the children's oh, book. I love it. And it says a pitcher, P-I-T-C-H-E-R, book for grown-ups, 21 plus, and it's written by Anne E. Bryden. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Oh, I that's love that. What a great cover. <laughs> oh, wonderful. And Christina, how about you? Uh, no, I guess my last one was going to be Judith Bennett because, yes, most of the books that I read about beer history are not actually beer history books as such. Mm -hmm. It just subtly includes them in a That's little. That's where it little, is. Yeah. It's, yeah. Like a, beer history is often found in big books about something completely different, usually economic history. Well, not completely different, but economic history or something like that. And then it's like a paragraph. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Um, they're there. They're there. <laughs> they're there. Absolutely. I know. And I need to start getting into a whole new category, sort of the, the illustrated beer books. I know M. Sauter's Pints and Panels uh, book has oh. come out. So I, it's not here yet, but I, one will come. Uh, Pre-orders. So that'll be yes. fun. That'll be fun. Looking forward to that. Because again, I think anything that's, you know, a way in for people that, again, is not gatekeeping, is fun, is accessible, mm. you know, all good. We, we want more of it. Well, I think also like there are some amazing documentaries coming out. Yeah. Um, uh, Tinu Divers, um, This Belongs to Us, which is about yes. the history yeah. of Black women in brewing in, in the South is just amazing. And we got a snippet at it of it, I should say, at the Women's International Beer Summit, which was just incredible. Yeah. Um, 
so I cannot wait for that to come out yeah. and, and see that. Um, so I think that there's, there's other avenues mm-hmm. of beer history besides your traditional books. And like I said, there's a lot of really amazing blogs and podcasts and uh, the Chicago Museum, which for full transparency, I'm on the League of Historians there has a lot of really amazing talks by beer historians and they try to make their research accessible and I think those talks are really important to go to, or if you're interested in beer history to attend. Um, so I think there's lots of ways to get into beer history in, besides um, reading a book mm-hmm. as such. Definitely. Wonderful. And so with that, I will say thank you, everyone. And we are on all of the socials. I'll run through them in a minute. But if you've been watching on the YouTubes, Erica's wearing her beer ladies hoodie. I also have a a beer ladies hoodie on today. Uh, You can get those at our merch shop. I'm not going to make you go try to type it out because it's got hyphens. Hyphens are hard, but there are links in our show notes. They're on all of our socials. It's on, it's on a spread shirt kind of a jam. So they're out there. We would love to see you guys wearing our stuff or putting up our stickers surreptitiously at a festival. There are a lot of festivals coming up. Just, just saying, but uh, before we see you there, we are at Beer Ladies Pod on Twitter, on Instagram. We're at Beer Ladies Podcast on Facebook and on um, on YouTube. Again, the merch shop is out there. We would love to see you guys there. We do have a buy me a coffee, but of course you're buying us a pint. So just full full transparency. We you know we we may drink a pint instead of a you know coffee cup. So just FYI. But thank you guys so much for listening. We'll be back again next week, and we'll see you then. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.